Good morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. We are meeting this Tuesday morning before floor to consider amendments to S-15. And I think what I'd like to do is run through all three amendments and, um, and then we can uh, take our votes on them um, after we've heard all three of them. Um, so I think first what I'll do is have uh, Representative Townsend, who is here visiting from the Appropriations Committee, um, share with us the Appropriations Committee amendment. And you should all be able to find that on our committee page. Welcome. Th thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for the record, uh, Representative Maida Townsend from South Burlington on behalf of House Appropriations. Um, in addition to the text of our amendment, which is uh, on your web page, there is also the text of the most recent uh, fiscal note, uh, as recent as yesterday. It, it is posted on your web page. Um, so our amendment to S15. As the uh, bill came to us, we saw that it incurs uh, costs to the office of the Secretary of State, both um, one-time costs in the near term and then recurring costs uh, virtually in perpetuity. And yet there was no appropriation within the bill to address, to address any of these costs. Um, from our perspective, uh, that is a problem. And it is because of that that we offer our amendment. And the amendment deals solely with uh, one-time costs in the near term. They are only the costs um, which are addressed in the fiscal note, which need to be um, which need to be taken care of in fiscal year 22, so as to have a state of readiness when we reach the beginning of the uh, general election cycle in uh, calendar year. Uh, 2022, which would be into FY23. Uh, so our amendment, you will see it is in the amount of an appropriation in the amount of $800,000. And it's in three components. Um, the, the second and third components basically speak for themselves. But component number one, the $400,000 in general fund dollars, uh, merit a, a bit of context. And it, the context goes back to early January when the Joint Fiscal Committee authorized $2 million in CRF money to the Secretary of State's office to assist towns, um, at, to, to assist with the mailings for town and annual meetings. Uh, that was 2 million CRF dollars. As time went on, it became clear that the full amount would not be needed for reimbursement regarding these costs. And the Secretary of State's office has uh, already returned 1 million of that 2 million to the CRF fund for other use. And uh, at this point, there's approximately a half million remaining unspoken for with regard to reimbursements to localities uh, with just a, a handful of meetings yet out there not having taken place. Uh, that being the case, this $400,000, which shows in component one for meeting the $800,000 need in FY22, this involves taking 400,000 of the remaining CRF dollars, which the Secretary of State's office has from that original 2 million CRF authorization. That $400,000 is taken out for CRF eligible expenses mm -hmm. and swapped with general fund dollars, which would then go into the um, Secretary of State's coffers to uh, fill the hole left when the CRF 400,000 was taken out. This kind of swap is nothing new. We've, we've needed to do this over the last several months, one way or the next, to enable the um, most effective use of, of dollars 
throughout the budget. So the uh, 400,000 in component one for the 800,000 does show as general fund dollars, but it is attained by having swapped out $400,000 of CRF dollars, uh, understanding that CRF dollars are not eligible to be used uh, for election matters in, in, this, in the context of this proposal. So you've got $400,000, or we have in the proposal, $400,000 general fund, uh, general fund, and then component two is that the second 400,000 to reach 800,000 total would come from the Secretary of State's service fund or the Help America Vote Act funds to the extent possible. Beyond that possible extent, uh, the, the funds would come from other federal dollars which might be made available moving forward to the Secretary of State's office. And then component three, to, uh, to protect the uh, Secretary of State's office and to protect the work which this bill requires of them to the extent that, um, to the, extent that the related one-time uh, elections costs cannot be funded or absorbed as outlined in components one and two, then the Secretary of State's office would include any remaining unmet costs in their FY uh, in their FY22 budget adjustment act proposal in January. So that is the outline of the $800,000 and how we managed to package it, how we managed to create it. Um, in the fiscal note, you will see that there's an explanation of what the $800,000 are needed for. It is in essence, $300,000 for secure drop boxes, 150 units at 2,000 each. $100,000 for mechanized letter openers, 100 units at $1,000 each. $100,000 for software upgrade. This is to uh, ensure that our elections management system is right up to its best performance measure, and $300,000 for voter education, primarily for media buys. Um, this package of expenses um, is based in the experience, it's informed by the experience which we have from the 2020 election cycle. So there's solid uh, data behind uh, these, these costs. Um, that in essence, touches on our amendment. I underscore, we do not in our amendment reach to the um, ongoing recurring costs, which will come into play as we discuss budget matters uh, in January. Uh, also in F15, as it, uh, F15, excuse me, um, S15, as uh, it came to us, there was reference to an assistant elections director. I want to underscore that when the House was working initially on the FY22 budget, um, we already at that point, never having seen S15 at that point in time, we nonetheless understood the burden being borne by our elections division at the Secretary of State's office and the House had already built into the budget and the Senate maintains it in the budget in their version, um, uh, an additional position, an assistant elections director. So that piece is already covered. Our vote on our amendment in committee was 10-1-0 favorable. And our vote on the bill as 15 as amended with our, uh, our proposed amendment was 8-3 zero favorable. Um, and so any questions that you might have, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much, Representative Townsend. Um, questions from committee members on uh, the Appropriations Committee Amendment. Well, you must have done such a bang up job that nobody has any questions for you. Oh, Representative Higley has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Townsend. Just a question. So the ongoing costs that you've referred to, which there was no dollar amount, 
there is the printing and mailing out of the ballots. Is that correct? That is correct. And in the fiscal note, you will see a figure listed of two million forty-three thousand dollars for the entire package. It's in. It's it's there, um, in the fiscal note. And, and that'll again come from uh, a host of areas and possibly some of the general fund money as well. At this point in time, it's impossible for me to answer that question. It would be mere speculation. This, this will need to be part of what um, we discuss in appropriations moving forward uh, with the FY23 um, budget cycle. There is that you okay, will you. see. You will see also in the fiscal note that at JFO there is a suggestion as to a path forward with regard to the recurring costs. But uh, again, that's simply a suggestion. It's within the realm of possibilities. Okay, thanks, Representative Leclerc. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning again, Madam. Very thorough explanation as always. So I wasn't really keeping track of the math. So of uh, this 800,000 is all of this one-time monies, is that the expectation? Yes. The whole thing. So if F15, one time. if F15 didn't go anywhere at all, would we be expending this money, do you think? Um, as I understand it, the 800,000 one time, as well as the recurring costs are um, based in the requirements upon the Secretary of State's office in S15. And I do see on the uh, screen here that there is representation from the Secretary of State's office and I have no idea if perhaps they could shed more light on that. Sure, if I could have a follow up question there, Madam Chair, um, maybe to Chris or or will um, is this eight hundred thousand? This exclusively, I guess, allocated to the language for S fifteen. Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. I can give you more detail, Rep. Leclerc, but if that's sufficient, that's it. It would all only be spent if this bill passes. Okay. Thank you, Will. <clears throat> All right, committee, any other questions for Representative Townsend or from the Secretary of State's office perspective on the appropriation? All right, thank you so much, Representative Townsend. We will uh, see you on the floor. We have a few other pieces of business to conduct here this morning, so you're welcome to hang around, but I imagine you also have other places you could be this morning. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, next, I'd like to go to um, Representative McCarthy for uh, um, an overview of the amendment that he is putting forward. And if you can just help the committee understand the context here, since you and I uh, have talked uh, quite a bit about what's contained in here. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, I'm sure that many of us have received uh, emails since we passed S-15 out of committee um, and there were a couple of issues that came up that we wanted to take the opportunity to address. So uh, I appreciate our chair uh, working with me and uh, other members of the body and some town clerks and the secretary of state's office to present two instances of amendment here, um, which I'm offering. So the first instance allows ballot drop boxes to stay open on election day. So recall that in section 11 of S15, the language we voted out says that those secure ballot drop boxes have to close end of business the day before election day. And we heard from a number of town clerks um, and I had many emails forwarded to me by other members of the body. Why, why would we do that? We kept ours open on election day. And, um, and so uh, this provides the uh, item number two, the notwithstanding language. Uh, and I really wanna thank uh, Director Senning for helping with this so that a board of civil authority can choose to keep the secure ballot drop box open on election day. So that's what instance one does. Do you want me to stop there, Madam Chair, in case anybody has any questions? I'm not seeing anybody diving in, <clears throat> so go right ahead. Great, and then the second instance of amendment has to do with some concerns that we heard from a couple of 
clerks, including uh, Representative Payala from Londonderry, who um, was concerned that the reasonable effort that we were requiring clerks to make to, con to find contact information other than the mailing address in that five day window before election day to notify a voter and let them know that they could cure a defective ballot. Um, she wanted to tighten up that language and really, and so we heard from clerks that they were worried that, you know, one voter might be treated differently than another voter that, that we shouldn't just make it any old contact info that we should really clarify. Um, and so working with uh, the Secretary of State's office and the clerks, we came up with this language that really specifies that we're requiring clerks to make a reasonable effort to contact voters in that five day window where a postcard probably wouldn't get to them in time. And that they only have to, in order to <laughs> achieve that standard, look at information that's in the voter checklist or on the online management system. And uh, Director Senning talked a lot with me about how um, we already have a lot of voters who have their phone and email on the My Voter page on the online management system. Um, and that part of the media buy that we were just talking about in the, in the outreach campaign before the next general election will include encouraging folks to update their um, information that they have on file. So um, we're tightening up this language a little bit and uh, hopefully providing some clarity. That's it. Questions from committee members. Representative LeClaire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mike, I'm just looking to make sure I understand what I'm reading here in part B, the second instance of amendment. So are you, are you saying that within that five day window, the clerks are or are not required to um, try to contact the voter? So they are required to try to contact the voter. So that remains the same. Mm -hmm. The change from our original language is what resource they have to look at in order to find alternative contact information like a phone or email. So this language says that um, they'll provide notice to the voter as soon as possible using any contact information for the voter other than the mailing address, right? Because postcard's not gonna work in that tight a time frame. That is contained in the voter checklist. And so that means the, the voter checklist, the online management system, my voter page. So they don't have to scour the earth to try to find a phone and email in order to make that reasonable effort. They just mm -hmm. need to at least look at what's on file. Okay, thanks, Mike. A follow-up question for, I guess, Will, if that'd be all right, Madam Chair. Absolutely. Um, it, is my memory fading here, or is it current statute that that five-day window, they're not, um, what is it about the five-day window right now? There's really nothing in the five-day window right now. You can request a ballot and request a ballot be mailed to you all the way up to the day before the election. But yep. what we've talked about a lot of times, Rep. LeClaire, is through guidance and experience, the, the clerks generally will try to tell those voters, this isn't gonna make it to you on time. You're not gonna be able to get it back to me. Why don't you come down and vote in the office or okay. on election day? So they, really they, I've always been clear with them though, if they can't, if they get a valid request by that deadline and they can't reach the voter, they should mail it out. So they mm -hmm. meet their I responsibility. See. Okay, so there's really nothing in statute, Will. It's kind of like a best practices type of discussion. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yep. Can I follow up on that, Madam Chair? So just to be clear, that right now you can't cure a defective ballot at all. So this whole notification scheme is part of our new ballot curing policy that's in the rest of S-15. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, McCarthy. That's, that's right. Any other questions for Rep. McCarthy on this amendment? All right, excellent. So Representative Toof, thank you for being with us. Um, go ahead and introduce the committee to your amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, House Government Ops Committee um, for having me in today. Thank you for um, looking at this amendment. Um, if anyone doesn't have it, it's on 20, page 2257 of today's House calendar. Uh, my amendment is simple. It, um, a couple months ago, I came in and presented a very similar amendment to a bill for town meeting day this year. Basically what my amendment will be doing will be requiring um, 
town clerks to mail out ballots for town meeting day, um, except for those that are voting via the floor. So if, if you vote via Australian ballot, um, this amendment will require a town to vote, uh, send out ballots not less than 20 days uh, before the election or as soon as they are possible. Um, or as soon as they're available, excuse me. Um, the reason I, I, I'm really passionate about this, I think that um, mail-in voting last year was a, a success across the state. And I think um, expanding this to town meeting day will also get better voter engagement. Um, there, you know, there's a lot of talk around the country about voter suppression um, in America and uh, keeping in the spirit of this bill, I kind of want to push this to uh, town meeting day because I feel like those are the elections that have the lowest um, turnouts uh, historically when we when we go to the polls in March, uh, 15 to 20 percent, I think statewide, I don't have the exact numbers on me, but those are for me, those are really concerning when we're voting on really important topics like um, school budgets and school boards that uh, to me, there's nothing more important than my child's education. Um, and I would love a, a more representative government um, of people coming out to vote for these things. So that's why I, I'm adding this in. I, I know there's gonna be a matter of uh, question right now, that, or a question of uh, expense for this. And, and to, to, um, to that matter, I feel like that, that this, right now, this will be on the, the expense of the town. Um, I think this is something that we should look at big picture going forward, how the state can, can finance this. Because um, I think as we look at uh, how our, our elections will be going forward, I think the mail-in balloting is a great way to get people engaged. Uh, people won't have to typically drive to or make a phone call or do anything. Uh, they just get the ballot and they vote. And I think that was a very successful thing. And I think a lot of people that typically didn't vote ended up voting in 2020. And I think that if we give them that option with our town meeting um, and, and special meetings, I forgot to mention that it also applies to special meetings, um, special municipal meetings uh, or elections. Um, so I think that'll just get better engagement. Um, and I, I realized when I came in in January, it was kind of too late. We, we, it, you know, we were less than two months away from town meeting day and it was, it was kind of a tall, um, it was a tall order, but I think if we look at 2022, maybe even 2023, um, I would be willing to look at that. I think that it's just, it's something to me that's really important to get better voter engagement across the state. So thank you. Thank you, Representative. Any questions from committee members for the sponsor of this amendment? Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Toof. Uh, I just want to be clear that uh, the folks that currently have a floor town meeting, uh, this, this wouldn't affect. Am I correct? You are correct. This would only be those that vote via Australian ballot. Okay, thank you. Representative Merwicki. Thank you and good morning. Thanks for, for bringing this to our attention. Uh, just as a some sort of guide to what kind of costs uh, this would this would entail. Not sure how many people live in the town that you're in, but do you know what the estimated costs for your town would be? You know, I don't have that answer to how much with the estimated cost. I did speak with uh, one of our town, I, I represent two um, towns, I uh, represent McCarthy and I represent the same district. And um, <laughs> I spoke with the, one, one of our town um, clerks and, and she expressed that, it wasn't as uh, it wasn't that hard of a, a built order, and she could actually um, use a mail house or or some some sort of uh, private company that could do this, and it would be fairly cheap. But I would, I mean, that's something that I think for 2020, uh, 2022 um, is something I think I will probably be bringing legislative legislation where we look into um, the cost and have um, a real conversation about that going forward. So I don't I don't have the the exact cost on that. Thank you. Uh, Representative Murphy for the question though. Representative McCarthy. <clears throat> so Representative Tooth, um, thanks for bringing this because I, I think we really are wanting to move in this direction obviously of having more participation. Um, I was wondering if you talked to the city clerk about some of the logistical concerns that she had, um, especially back in January and that are still kind of out you know, 
out there in terms of questions of, of that mail house, it's not just about cost, but also about the timeline. And if there might be some other considerations that we need to think about in order to make it more practical for more towns to do this uh, for the next town meeting day. Yeah, absolutely. I, I haven't I haven't reached out to her. Um, I was really busy trying to pin this in with Mother's Day and all the other stuff going on this weekend. So I do um, I do apologize to to her and, and to you that I didn't uh, reach out to her. But um, you, you're absolutely right, and, and that's what I you know one of my reasons of bringing this forward is to start this conversation because even if I know that it, it could fail, um, these are the kind of conversations about going forward. Do we give ourselves enough time um, to have ballots ready? before town meeting day, um, because th that is one of the biggest orders, you know, 20 days to get everything in, or 20 days before the election that mail everything out and, and have everyone ready. It, it's a tall, it's a tall order for our town clerk. So, you know, that I would be willing if, if the, if the committee would be willing, I, I would be willing to push this out on a date that's later than 2022. Um, because I just, I, I think that this is a very important, um, it's a very important process that I think we should adopt, but maybe we're not ready for it, but I would like to see the state figure out where, where we, how we can be prepared for it in the future. So thank, thank you for that question. Representative Behovsky. Thank you. Um, I would love, do you know um, if the Town Clerks Association has thoughts on this amendment, first of all? I have not talked to the Town Clerks Association. Okay. Um, and then my other question, so I know that, you know, as we were in deliberation, I guess it's not really a question. Um, it, we also talked about the primaries being another space to sort of explore this. And I wonder if this is a place to aim towards, but not set a specific date at, in, in this moment so that we can really get those logistics in place to make sure that it is, equitable and you know because I so I worry I worry that if some towns are required to do it and we're not offering funding like there's just so many pieces here that we don't have answers to that I wonder if 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 it is a an aspiration to move towards and and we we may not be ready yet yeah and and, and if I may answer that yeah I, I I'm personally against unfunded mandates it's something that I mean I, I serve on house education and that's one of our biggest concerns is when we're like hey schools need to do this and and we don't fund it, it's like, okay, then why would we want to do that? So that would be something that I would definitely want to look at um, if for you know future elections. I, 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 like I said, I understand this is a very tall order for a lot of town clerks across the state. Representative Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Tooth. But I have a question for Will. Um, in your experience, do you have any opinion on town by town cost or actually capacity when it comes to individual vendors printing this number of small batch uh, ballots for towns across the state, whether or not that would be plausible within the time frame? I don't have, it's really hard to pinpoint um, cost due to the variable circumstances across municipalities. What I can tell you is currently we're at right about at $400,000 of reimbursements sought for this year's annual meetings to our office from those CRF funds. Um, and I do know that a lot of the municipalities, I just wanna point out to the committee to make sure you recognize this is written to apply to school districts as well as towns and cities since it refers to municipal bodies and municipalities um there was some there was some difficulty in finding mailing services generally though everybody was able to scrap it together that i'm aware of um, from various mailing services in the state although it was a lot of people doing um, ballot printing and mailing for the first time is my impression um, i think that before making this move if if we ever were to move in this direction to mandate towns and school districts to mail out ballots we would need to make adjustments to the local election timeline to um, accommodate it. And if I may follow up, what, what would the difference in cost attribution be for school district elections as opposed to municipal elections, funding stream wise, if any? I don't, I, it's mainly dependent on the number of voters you have. 
So if you're talking big union districts with a lot of voters included, it's going to be higher costs. Thank you. Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, back of the envelope estimate for the city of Barrie would be uh, around 5,000 um, to cover postage, printing, envelopes, et cetera. Uh, and ours is 100% Australian ballot vote. I hope when those discussions about timeline arise, uh, somebody would ask the question, not asked for over 100 years, why are we voting in March? It's the weather's not particularly advantageous. And as my uh, good friend from Barrytown um, has already discovered voting in May, people are a lot happier <laughs> than they are in March. Thank you. Representative Vyhovsky. I think that there is a lot of great information here um, and people certainly know that I'm supportive of making voting as accessible as, as we can. I would certainly encourage if this is a path we go down to connect with the towns that did in fact um, do universal mail balloting right out of the gate. Um, Essex did their school budget and their town meeting by universal mail balloting back in 2020. And I think there's lots of good information to be gathered about what works and what didn't work and how to adjust the timeline. But for me, it feels like we just don't have the information yet. But I certainly would, you know, am supportive of, of exploring this avenue. Um, Chris Winters. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to say quickly that we really appreciate Representative Toof's um, proposed amendment and his support of expanding vote by mail. We had a similar conversation on the Senate side when Senator Parent proposed a very similar amendment. Uh, and just, I, I'm sure the committee's aware, but I'll just point out that there was an amendment on the Senate side to modify our reporting requirements. So we very much agree with what Senator Toof and, and uh, sorry, Representative Toof and many of you have said this morning, which is that we all want to see more participation in our elections. We all want to see this expanded to the primary and uh, town and annual meetings but there are a lot of logistics and there are a lot of financial issues to consider. So in the amendment on the Senate side added, adding to our um, report requirements was for us to study issues related to implementing universal vote by mail for mun municipal and primary elections. And we very much intend to talk to all the stakeholders to see how we could possibly do this for primaries and local elections. And that report is due back on or before January 30th of 2023. And the reason for the kind of long timeline is that we're going to have our hands full in the, in the next year. Um, any amendment that happened next year to expand to another election really wouldn't be in time for the 2022 elections in time for us to implement it. So therefore the, the longer timeline and by January 30th of 2023, you'll have a report back from us that makes some recommendations on implementing vote by mail for municipal and primary elections. Thank you. And just to quickly follow up on that with Chris, he's right with that timeline, why it makes sense for January, 2023. We couldn't, we couldn't make the changes early next session to apply to annual meeting next year. And I just wanted to remind the committee that the bill does as currently written and as passed authorize towns to do this. And so towns next year, hopefully another substantial chunk of them will choose to do so. And it'll give us another set of data and experience to build on in that report. Thanks, Will. Uh, Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So that, uh, my question was actually for Will. So is there anything in, um, is it S-15, does it just apply to the general election or isn't there language in there that the local municipal bodies could elect to do this with town meeting currently? Well, if S-15 was to pass. That's right, both of those. Only mandated for the general election, but authorizes them to vote to do it in their local elections. Very good, thank you. It authorizes the municipalities who already have adopted Australian ballot. So if your school district or your town does their annual meeting in person, um, the legislative body can't decide to switch to Australian ballot and, and mail ballots. But if you already have a, 
an Australian ballot uh, budget adoption and annual meeting, you can, uh, this authorizes municipalities to go forward. Uh, Representative Tooth. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just to follow up, that's the section that I, um, I changed, um, I believe it's section three um, in the bill. And that's where I change it from basically a shall to a, or a may to a shall. So thank you. And thank you for having me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for being here, Representative Tooth. Any other questions, folks, um, for either the Secretary of State's office or the sponsor of this amendment? We do have uh, a couple other pieces of business before us uh, that we need to try to finish before we go to the floor at 10. So I'd like to uh, move now to, uh, to do some voting on these three amendments uh, to S15. So we have the Appropriations Committee Amendment. Anybody wanna make a motion? I'll move, I'll move it, Madam Chair. Excellent. We've got a couple of voices in there. Thank you. <clears throat> Representative Colston, when you are ready. I shall call the roll. Gannon. Yes. Mariki. Yes. LeClaire. Yes. Hooper. Yes. Colston. Yes. Behovsky. Yes. Yes. Higley. Yes. McCarthy. Yes. Copeland Hanses. Yes. The vote is 11 0 0. Passes. All right. Um, now we just need a motion on the McCarthy Amendment. I'll move that oh. we find my amendment favorable. Excellent. <laughs> Second <laughs> or first. <laughs> Representative Colston, when you're ready. I shall begin the roll call. Gannon. Yes. Mariki. Yes. McClare. Yes. Hooper. Yes. Colston. Yes. Anthony. Yes. Behovsky. Yes. Lefebvre. Yes. Higley. Yes. McCarthy. Yes. Copeland Hanses. Yes. The vote is 11 0 0. It passes. All right. And on to the Toop Amendment. I'll be the Grinch and move that we find it unfavorable. Okay, so a yes means no. <laughs> a, a yes means no thank you to Representative Tooth. Um, Representative McCarthy, or sorry, Merwicki. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> my, my concerns here, this is a good idea that I'm, I'm not sure is ready for prime time yet. Um, I think there's some good ideas, but there needs to be some, um, some more flesh put on this. and. Uh, I'm concerned that for some towns, it's going to be a surprise, especially since it's <laughs> when we're at town meeting, as soon as a box of pencils gets added to the budget, we know about it. So uh, that's one of the concerns I have with this. And, and I'm just wondering if there's a way, a middle way we can find to put this in the parking lot for future to make sure that the idea gets, gets the time and, and attention it, it deserves, but it, uh, I'm concerned right now, it's just not ready for prime time. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think Director Senning made a really good point that when, uh, because we're authorizing this for the municipalities and school districts who already do Australian ballot, we hopefully will have um, more experience and more information uh, about how to do this. And I, I'm concerned in particular about the timeline um, because local election ballots are only required to be printed 20 days ahead of time. And it's really difficult. I mean, that timeline for municipalities and school districts, I know that the boards are, are frequently quite stressed to try to get, uh, to get everything um, 
put in order to meet that 20 day timeline and uh, and to be a, a, a really well functioning uh, vote by mail system, I would think we would need more than 20 days. Um, Rep Pihovsky. I just wanted to, um, and I don't think, I don't know that this needs to be added in the bill, but the budgeting piece is the piece that I, that feels really impactful, particularly for some of our smaller towns, as Representative Merwicki points out, you know, a box of pencils can really be problematic. And, and in some instances, it sounds like we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so, I, and, and I recognize the smaller towns would have a smaller budgetary need because they have less ballots, but I do really want to start to get a handle on what would this cost and looking at how we, as, as Representative Tu pointed out, how we might build a funding stream in so that the towns don't have to bear this cost. So I don't know if that needs to be added specifically into the report or if I can just say it and the Secretary of State's office will make sure that they look at those pieces. I would guess that they will because they are pretty good at uh, covering all their bases. Um, and, uh, you, you know, in, in particular, it's worth noting that it, if this requirement were to fall on our school districts and our towns, that's all coming out of our property taxes. So I'd prefer not to, to do it in this way and until we have figured out a different funding stream. Um, uh, Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I am I share a lot of the same concerns that everybody else does as far as timing and cost, but I'm going to support this because I do think it's a very worthy conversation to have. As the presenter had indicated, we have very low turnout on our general, uh, not our general, but our town meeting day votes in our school boards. And I don't know about most of you, but those affect me rather significantly on an ongoing basis. And I would very much like to have as much turnout as we can possibly have. I do think that this is the appropriate vehicle for this to be attached to so that we can have those robust discussions, whether it be about the funding or the timing, because those are all very valid questions to have. Um, but if we don't start having it now, when are we going to? So I am going to end up supporting this, recognizing that, uh, again, the presenter of the amendment was amenable to pushing out an effective date and having more subsequent conversations about the funding and timelines. I see no other hands. And so I'll remind folks that the motion on the table is to find this amendment unfavorable. So a yes vote means no to the amendment, um, just so we're all clear. Um, Rep. Colston, when you are ready. I shall begin the roll call. Gannon. I vote yes to find this amendment unfavorable. LeClaire. No. Merwicki. Yes. Hooper. Yes. Colston. Yes. Anthony. Yes. Pihovsky. Yes. Lefebvre. No. Higley. No. McCarthy. Yes. Copeland Hanses. Yes. The vote is eight, three, zero, and we find the amendment unfavorable. <laughs> Uh, thank you for being with us this morning, Representative Tooth. Um, we've got two other pieces of business that we need to try to uh, transact here before we go to the floor. Uh, so I'm going to invite Becky Wasserman to, uh, to give us a, just a sort of 30,000 foot view of the differences between uh, the Senate passed version of 449 and what the House passed and just for those following along at home, this is an act relating to membership and duties of the Pension Investment Committee uh, Commission and the creation of a pension benefits design and funding task force. Welcome, Becky. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. Um, so I did prepare a side by side, um, which I think will be helpful as I go through this. Um, and I'll try to do it quick. I know you're short on time. Um, so that is uh, posted on your website. Um, 
so the uh, as you recall, this bill is um, primarily doing two things. It is uh, changing the membership and duties of the Vermont Pension Investment Commission. And it is also um, creating a task force to look at uh, pension benefit design and, and funding for the state employees retirement system and the state teachers retirement system. Um, so the uh, main changes that they did was uh, in, in Senate that passed out of the Senate was um, uh, mainly changing the section on the Pension Investment Commission, um, making some changes to the uh, membership and duties of the task force. And then they also added in a, a new committee, a, a legislative uh, pension oversight committee. Um, so those are where the, the main changes are. And then there are a couple of se sections where there were no changes or very minor ones. Um, so I can just highlight starting at the beginning of the bill in section one um, where there were some changes. And um, if it's easier, I can use the side by side if that for now, um, just to go through. I think that would probably be most okay. efficient. Great. Um, so the first uh, change here um, is in the defini definition section for the commission. As you recall, there was an amendment on the House floor um, to amend the definition of independent to say that if somebody's uh, spouse, parent, or child is a beneficiary of the plan, that that individual would have a material or direct interest in the plan. Um, so they removed that um, relationship linkage. So it's just uh, if, an, if an individual has is a beneficiary of the plan, then they have that material and direct interest, but not um, through that relationship. Um, the other main changes were amending the, the number of members on the commission. So um, their version has nine members and they've removed the commissioner of financial regulation. Um, they've also uh, amended how the uh, an alternates term limits count towards the, the total terms that a person can serve. So as you recall, the, the total term limits are uh, four-year terms for three, three terms. Um, and if you serve as an alternate that counted um, towards that 12 years, they have uh, said that one of those alternate terms would not count towards that 12-year cap. Um, in terms of the chair of the committee, they also made a couple changes. So um, your version had the, an interim chair being appointed had to be either a financial expert or independent. And um, they have changed that to being both. So an interim chair would need to be a financial expert and independent. Um, the actual chair of the committee in your version did not have any of the independence or financial expert requirements. So they added that in for the chair as well. And finally, they removed the chair's 20 year term limit. Um, I think the idea was that the uh, consultant that's being hired is going to be looking at what the appropriate term limit was. So uh, that would be something that could be uh, updated after that um, report comes out. Um, okay, any questions? Okay. So in section two, there was a minor change just removing the reference to the uh, this is a section that deals with the transition of member terms. So since the commissioner of financial regulation was removed from the committee, um, the, the reference to that commissioner's um, transition was also removed in this section. Um, section three of the bill deals with some reports that the commission had to prepare for FY22. Um, one of those, as I just mentioned, was hiring a consultant to do an assessment of how to get the commission to be um, a standalone entity. Those were, that was the word used in your version of the bill. They just replaced standalone entity with independent entity. It's a minor change there. Um, there were no changes to sections four through nine of the bill. Um, then section 10 of the bill is the pension uh, task force. Um, so the main changes here um, 
we're amending the membership of the, that task force. So they reduced the House and Senate members from three to two each. Um, they removed the commissioners of financial regulation and human services and the director of retirement division, uh, but they included the secretary of administration. Um, the powers and duties of the task force were also amended. Um, I've, I don't know if you want me to go through all of these. I've listed what, what the changes were in the chart. Um, so I don't think it's necessary to okay. go through in detail. I appreciate okay. the side by side though. That is so very helpful. Um, so I think one of the main ones I would highlight is just the first one um, in your bill. Um, there was language about uh, looking at the um, setting a pension stabilization target for the employee system and the teacher system um, and reducing the, the ADAC and the unfunded liability by the amount of the increases that were in the um, actuarial valuation reports for those two systems between FY21 and FY22. So this change is actually... Um, slightly looking at this slightly differently by recommending strategies to lower the ADAC and unfunded liabilities with those reports in mind. Um, so I think it's the idea was that um, it was a little clearer with respect to what exactly the task force would be would be looking at there. Um, and then I've highlighted all the other changes that they made with respect to um, what the committee would be, what the task force would be reviewing. Um, there were some also some minor changes in subsection E that um, the task force would have the fiscal assistance from JFO and the state treasurer and committee support services from ledge operations um, and that ledge council and JFO would be authorized to do the contracting to hire um, an outside actuarial benefit and legal expert. Um, and then finally, in terms of the reporting requirement, uh, Senate GovOps changed it such that there would be an interim report that was due October 15th and a final report due by December 2nd. Um, and then, um, so moving on, they added um, in section 11, a new, a new committee, as I mentioned, it's the Joint Legislative Pension Oversight Committee. So this is a legislative committee. It has um, three House and three Senate members, and they are tasked with looking at, um, with working with and providing assistance to other legislative committees that uh, deal with matters relating to retirement and OPEB. Um, so this committee would uh, look at issues of public policy relating to retirement benefits and health benefit design innovations, um, changes to any statutory provisions that relate to the retirement systems. And they would also review the annual appropriations for the retirement systems. Um, so this is an advisory committee. They don't have, um, they don't have the authority to act on any of these issues. So they would just operate in the same way that um, other oversight committees in the legislature operate. Um, so the language also sets up how often they can meet um, that they have uh, assistance from ledge council and ledge operations and JFO. Um, and then finally, it also requires that VPIC and the re retirement board submit some reports to this committee every year. Um, and then sections 12 and 13 are just um, renumbering of sections in, in your version of the bill. Um, to account for this new oversight committee section. So that was a very quick. <laughs> Great. That was a highlight, that, but <laughs> that was an excellent jog through. And I know that um, committee members may want to uh, dig a little deeper into the details of this. Um, but given that we're bumping up against floor time, um, does, do folks have any questions for Becky on what she just reviewed with us? Is there any part of this that you? feel you need a deeper understanding of at this moment. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. And while there's parts of this that I 
uh, I think are interesting and uh, and indeed the the uh, oversight uh, committee is a really great idea that uh, frankly we didn't have time to incorporate into the bill on our side. So I'm thankful that the Senate did that. Um, but uh, I do feel like there are some parts of this that are uh, a, a marked departure from what uh, we did on the House side. And so I'm gonna uh, make a motion that we not concur and that we ask the speaker to appoint a committee of conference so that we can work these details out with our Senate counterparts. Do you need a second, Madam Chair? Sure. I'll second that. Uh, Representative Colston, are you ready to call the roll on that? I am. Give me one second. Can you- Can I just Madam clarify Chair, for process you... that this is another yes means no vote? Um, yes means you do not concur and you support going to a committee of conference. Okay. So yes means no concur. <clears throat> Representative Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Your uh, quick run through there, can you point out a little bit more what you think is egregious that we're voting to not concur on? Well, I certainly didn't use the term egregious. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Significant um, departure. I think that we, uh, we the, the makeup of the pension benefit design and funding task force was uh, quite different on our side. And I think we should um, seek to understand a little more about um, why the Senate did what they did. Um, but I, uh, I believe that is a, a big departure. And I would also like to um, understand a little bit more about the powers and duties section. Um, <laughs> and Representative Gannon, as the primary reporter of this, might have other thoughts. Do you want me to, to trip in, chime in, Matt? Sure. sure. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, well, I appreciate the hard work that the Senate did with respect to, to these proposed amendments. Um, I, I do think we need to take a look at the, the oversight um, commission. And I think because time is running so short um, that, you know, a committee of a conference is, is the best way um, to look at the changes that were proposed um, and resolve this um, so that we can um, hopefully pass a bill and move it on to the governor before the end of the session. Thank you. Uh, there are some things that the Senate did that I think move us significantly in the difference in a direction of acceptance by the people that are impacted by this. So I kind of favor this. Thank you. Representative Anthony. I, uh, Rep Hooper and Gannon sort of got my thunder. I, uh, I'm so worried that this uh, is not going to uh, get a signature um, promptly by going to conference. Um, that's my worry. And I really think this time is of the essence and that, and that frankly trumps uh, the departures under, understanding that there's bound to be a different process, different view on the Senate side. So I'm, I'm hung up, I'm stuck. Um, I wanna see this happen and I'm not sure that these are what's proposed are deal breakers for me. Um, but I understand the animus uh, uh, since we were pretty clear about what we wanted in the both the task force and the oversight uh, board. Um, but I'm, I'm still on the fence, thanks. Well, we are at that time of session where we need to begin <clears throat> to count legislative days. And uh, if we were to, um, delay action on this and try to craft a counter proposal that would need to go through the normal process on the House floor of uh, further proposal of amendment. And uh, there are fewer legislative days involved in both creating and acting on a committee of conference report because the, acting on the committee of conference report is a, is a one and done vote and uh, it doesn't require the second and third and um, and day's notice, so, um, or actually it does require notice. Uh, Representative Gannon. 
Madam Chair, that's a very good point. I mean, the most efficient way to get this bill passed and signed is to go to a conference committee um, and not try to have this committee work on a proposal of further amendment, um, which could take days. Um, whereas we could resolve this on the floor today to, to get it to a committee of conference. I, maybe I wasn't being clear. I was going to I was going to favor concurrence, and then it would be done. <laughs> as as was as am I. Uh, I don't think there's anything in this revision that is so objectionable that we could not move it forward based on the Senate's proposal. Any other committee discussion? All right, Representative Colston. You I shall are, begin the roll call. You have a, a, a motion on the floor to not concur. So yes means no thank you to the Senate version of the bill. And just to clarify, Madam Chair, um, who made the motion? I did. Thank you. Gannon. Yes. Mariki. Yes. Leclerc. Yes. Cooper. Cooper. No. Colston. Yes. Anthony. Anthony. No. Bihovsky. No. Lefebvre. Yes. Higley. Yes. McCarthy. Yes. Copeland Hanses. Yes. The vote is eight three zero in support of a committee of conference. All right. Thank you so much, Becky, for being with us. Um, and last but not least, um, and we are running short on time. Um, Tucker Anderson is going to uh, explain to us the small amendment that the Senate made to H-177. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the Senate amendment to H-177, which was the City of Montpelier Charter Amendment, uh, makes an amendment in the first section to ensure that citizens of the United States can vote in city elections. As the charter amendments were put together and passed the House, uh, the charter amendments proposed to allow anyone who is a legal resident of the United States to vote in city elections, but that was defined as non-citizens who reside in the United States on a uh, permanent or indefinite basis in compliance with U.S. immigration laws. It did not include United States citizens. I noted this in the Senate. They corrected that to ensure that U.S. citizens can vote in city elections. And that's what you have in front of you. Representative Gannon. I move to concur with the Senate proposal of amendment. That makes a lot of sense to me. Any questions from committee members? Seems like that was a good catch and um, and conforms the bill to what we uh, intended it to be. Uh, Representative Colston, when you're ready. I shall begin the roll call. Gannon. Yes. Mariki. Yes. Leclerc. No. Hooper. Yes. Colston, yes. Anthony. Yes. Bihovsky. Yes. Lefebvre. No. Higley. No. McCarthy. Yes. Copeland Hanses. Yes. The vote is 8-3-0 in support of the Committee of Conference. <clears throat> No, concur. 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 I'm sorry, concur. But thank you. I like the first comment better. 
little paperwork here. All right. Uh, thank you, Tucker, for um, joining us this morning. And nice work, committee. We are going to head now to the floor since um, we may be through announcements. And